and welcome to the Bethel Church Podcast, located in the heart of the Black Hills. Our focus is to live, grow, love, and serve for the sole purpose to make Jesus known. So I want you to turn your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 3. I've mentioned in the last few weeks a guy named George Whitfield. George Whitfield was a great revivalist. He was a great uh, winner of souls back uh, centuries ago in the 1700s. And uh, there was amazing stories and biographies that were written about him that shed some light on the transformation, which I touched on a little bit last week, the transformation that he uh, had in his life as he met Jesus, as he stayed in this place of religion, and then he moved into this relationship area that really just transformed him and transformed who he was. It was a, it's a great uh, uh, study if you ever want to study somebody or a person in history. George Whitfield's a great one. But it kind of goes well with what we've been talking about in Philippians, because Philippians is one of those one of those uh, one of those books that take us on this journey to transformation. Is what Paul is really doing. A few years ago, in the 1740s, there was a farmer by the name of Nathan Cole, and uh, Nathan Cole was from Connecticut. Uh, he heard about Whitfield and wanted to hear him preach. All right, he wanted to hear him. So one day he saw what looked like a cloud on the horizon. And he realized it was actually a cloud of dust that was being kicked up by the crowds of people who were flocking to hear Whitfield speak. Man, that's every preacher's dream right there, right? You, you just stand there and all of a sudden there's a cloud of dust because all the people are coming to hear you. Uh, it, it's a, it would be an amazing experience. Nathan Cole gathered his family, walked several miles to hear the great George Whitfield. When they did, Nathan Cole wrote something in his journal following that event. And these are the words he wrote. My hearing him preach gave me a heart wound. By God's blessing, my old foundation was broken up, and I saw that my righteousness would not save me. That's, that's telling if you think about what those words say. My righteousness will not save me. It's not our righteousness that saves us. It's not our righteousness that helps us do anything. It's the righteousness of Christ that we have in us. It's not our own. That began a process in Nathan Cole's life that eventually led to his conversion. Did you hear what I said? That eventually led to his conversion. It wasn't immediate, and many of the conversions during the Great Awakening were not immediate. Sometimes it would take weeks or months. For Cole, it was actually a couple of years before he really settled into a deeper assurance of his faith. And he was a lasting convert of one who became an evangelical leader in that little village in Connecticut. Cole's experience and the way he describes it is very important. He says this, my old foundation was broken up. I received a heart wound. My old foundation was broken up. And I realized that my righteousness would not save me. One of the things we do in the church often is we, we count converts. I'm just going to be honest with you for a minute. It drives me crazy. We count converts. I, I've done it. We've all been guilty of it. We say, okay, how many want to receive Jesus tonight? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five. I see your hand. I see your hand. Seven, eight. Nine. We do this stuff, right? That's what churches do. It's, it's a habit that we've formed in the church. But Jesus never said to make converts. He never says to make converts. He says to make disciples. Now when you look at Nathan Cole, Nathan Cole was a developing disciple. He wasn't just a convert. He wasn't somebody who went to Whitfield's preaching and stood there and said, yes, me. And then all of a sudden, now he's a Christian. It took him some time. And I think we're in a generation right now that takes time. They process things. So to be able to say, to say, okay, I want to count your hands, that's why if you notice, I don't do that anymore. What I do is I say this, I want you to fill out a card if today you would like to make that decision so that we can help you grow. Because we want to help you on that journey because it's a journey. It's not just a, boom, I'm six years old, I want to give my life to Jesus, now I'm going to heaven, I can do whatever I want to for the rest of my life. It's a journey. That's why Jesus said, go make disciples, not converts. Converts are easy. Jim Jones made converts. So what happened there? That was a problem. So, it's a lifelong process. So that's what today's about. 
This has to be one of the greatest passages of the book of, of Philippians that we're going to read today, uh, if not in all scripture. Essentially, Paul has given us his own testimony. He's given us a record of his own experience, especially inwardly. What happened in his life as he came to see that everything that he once valued was actually worthless compared to the value of knowing Christ. So Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 11. Here's what it says. If you don't have your Bibles, you can, turn it on the, you can look on the screen or you can just listen along. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has a reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Now, Paul is continuing a thought that we began looking at last week when he gives this warning about false teachers that are coming into the church and pushing all these ritualistic behaviors. It just so happened to be circumcision, the Judaizers, if you remember when we were talking about that. They came in and they started pushing all this stuff. Essentially, rather than boasting in Jesus Christ, they express confidence in the flesh. That is, in what human beings can attain and achieve in their own strength. I am this. This is me. This is what I've done. I've done this. I've done this. I've done this. I'm going to explain to you something. I don't care how much money, what kind of status you have. One day when you stand before God, you will be stripped of every earthly thing, and you will have to give an account for your life and how many people you brought to heaven with you. Who cares what you do here? Congratulations. We have money. Congratulations. We're successful. Congratulations. Enjoy it now because we won't take it to eternity with us. There's not a U-Haul going with your casket. doesn't happen that way. It's over. So Paul says, if anyone has a reason for confidence in the flesh, I have even more. And he goes on to list those in the next few verses. Then in verse 7 and 8, he expresses this exchange that he made as he counted all his loss for the sake of Christ. For the sake of gaining Christ, I will lose it all. You can have all that I've done. You can have all the accolades I've had. You can have all the credentials I have because I just want to know Jesus. And for the sake of that, you can push it all aside. I don't need it. That's what Paul's saying. Then he goes on to describe the benefits that came from gaining Christ. So I want to look at these things. I want to look at three things as we break down this passage. First, the use, using the language of nation, uh, Nathan Cole, let's look at the old foundation. All right, The old foundation. Paul's old foundation. Paul's credentials as he lists them in these verses. Then we will see the sweet exchange that he makes in verses 7 and 8. And then... The triple benefit, the triple benefit that comes to him from Christ in verses 9 through 11. So we're going to break that all down. We won't break it all down today, I can promise you, but we will in the next couple of weeks. So number one, the foundation. All right, look at the foundation, the old foundation. Nathan Cole says that uh, when he's talking about his conversion and his, his, uh, his journey as, as he goes and hears Whitfield and, and what he felt the Lord was saying to him. Then we see Paul alluding to this as I, he'll give up everything for the sake of gaining Christ. The old foundation. This is where Paul expresses his confidence in the flesh. This is his resume, his list of credentials. He lists seven things here 
that we could really break them down into two basic categories, all right? The first four things have to do with Paul's background, all right? When he, or his pedigree of who he is. In verses 5, he says, circumcised on the eighth day, the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews. He starts mentioning all these things. These things describe his credentials as an Israelite, as a Jewish person. These are his credentials. Paul had a lot of credentials. Paul could go anywhere. Paul really was a he was dual citizenship. He had all kinds of things going on in his life. He knew people, and he had status. Those four things described who he was. He was circumcised on the eighth day. He had the covenant sign given to him. All right, that's what this means. Just as God had commanded the Israelites in Genesis, in, the, in chapter 17, God commands them to be circumcised. And, of course, he's writing against people who are now pushing circumcision. That's the funny thing. Paul was this person, but then he looks at it, and because of the change that's taken place in his life, he is now condemning those religious rites that the Judaizers were bringing into the church and saying, you have to do this, you have to do this. And Paul's going, no, I've done all that, but I will forsake it all for the gain of knowing Jesus. That's the difference. That's what's going on here. So not only that, he was the people of Israel. He is a bona fide Israelite. Paul is an Israelite, right? He says he is of the tribe of Benjamin. The tribe of Benjamin was, of course, the tribe that gave Israel her first king. And it was the one tribe that he had remained loyal to Judah and to the house of David. And when the kingdom divided into two kingdoms, it was the one who remained loyal. Then he says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. Which probably means he was an Aramaic-speaking Jewish person. Paul was the man. Paul Paul had it all going on, right? He not only had the pedigree, he not only had the background, but he had the culture. That's why Paul was so effective in his writings and in his preaching, because he had the culture behind him. If you can know the culture, you can reach the culture. But if you don't know the culture, you're lost in the culture that you live in. Right? That's why I keep saying we have to understand the culture we're in right now. We have to understand this newer generation. We have to take our opportunities to understand them, to love them, to know them, to see what makes them tick. Because it's the older generations that's going to teach them how to hear the voice of the Lord in their life. But we have to know them first. We can't push them aside. So he knew all this stuff. He wasn't so much... One of the Hellenized Jews, the Greek-speaking Jews, although he did speak Greek, but he was raised speaking Aramaic. All this has to do with Paul's background. He's sharing every reason why he is better than them. You ever done that before? Try it. It won't take you very far. But it's fun. He shared his religious background, his racial background as a Jewish person. Then he goes on to speak of his achievements, his personal achievements as a religious person. And he still sees them as rubbish compared to knowing Jesus. He says, as to the law, he's a Pharisee. That means he belonged to a section of the Pharisees, which literally mean the separated ones. He was separated religiously from everybody else. Those were the most conservative the most meticulous law keepers among all the Israelites. They were zealous for the law. That was all, though. In fact, he was so zealous that he said he was a persecutor of the church. Can you imagine being so religious you killed people that came to Jesus? It sounds like a contradiction there, doesn't it? It sounds like, why would you do that? Because he was so bent on following the book and the letter of the law, he didn't understand what grace was. He didn't understand the mercy part of stuff. He didn't understand the atonement that Jesus did on the cross for us. He didn't see all that. All he saw was this is the rules you have to do. Remember how Paul, before he was converted, he was so zealous for law keeping and so against Christ And against Christianity, that he was seeking out Christians in order to imprison them, to put them in jail. He says this, as to the righteousness under the law, I was blameless. That's that's a strong statement. When you looked at his record of law keeping from an external point of view, he was blameless. He was faultless. 
It doesn't mean that he was sinlessly perfect, but it means that he looked at his life according to the external measurements of the law. Everything I do, I'm going to measure it by the law, by the old law. I'm going to do it by the old covenant until something awakened in him and he began to understand. See, in Romans 7, he, he says there was a time that he was alive without the law. But when the commandment came, he says this, sin came alive and I died. When we begin to understand the inward import of the law of God, especially the command that says you shall not covet, you begin to see that he had a sin problem. We all have a sin problem, right? There's a, there's a problem with sin. It's problematic. I heard a preacher say one time that it was the great serpent is still on the earth. And he has injected all mankind with his venom. And there's nothing we can do about it to get away from it. The only thing we can do is ask Jesus to help us. Because we've been injected. So his background his achievements. Now the reality is that very, very few of us would have this type of pedigree, right, of Paul. We, this pedigree is amazing that Paul had, that we would have this resume. But we still tend to do what Paul is fighting against here and what the Judaizers, the false teachers, were bringing forth or were they, what they were promoting. We still look to what we can achieve. We look to our backgrounds, we look to our accomplishments as the basis for righteousness with God. We look to those things. Oh, I have a big church. I must be right with God. If you read the news this week, you see that doesn't matter either. All these accolades that we can get mean nothing if we have no relationship with Jesus. Doesn't mean anything. You can build a you can build an earthly kingdom. All you need is a good, the right kind of money. You can build an earthly kingdom. But would you forsake all that just to know him? Because that's what Paul's saying. D.A. Carson in his, his, his little commentary concerning this, he's, he says this. Most who read these page, pages, I suspect, will not be greatly tempted to boast about their Jewish ancestry and ancient rites of race and religious heritage. But we may be tempted to brag about still less important things, our wealth, our status, our education, our emotional stability, our families, our political or business success, our denominational alignment, or even about which version of the Bible we use. I mean, he's not wrong. Churches split over which version of the Bible you use. You got King James only. You got anti-King James. You got, I mean, you got all kinds. I think all of us have, a prob have probably recognized some of these things, both in ourselves and others. We recognize stuff. People who boast in these other things, they think about that because certain things are true about their background or about their personal achievements, that therefore they are right with God or they are superior to others or have reasons to boast. That was kind of who Paul was talking to because when he was talking about it, he says, you've boasted about all these things. I can boast more than you because I'm better than you when it comes to earthly gains. But I forsake it all for the sake of Christ. There's a movie in 1981 called Chariots of Fire. Anybody heard of that? Chariots of Fire? How many like that movie? Okay, there you go. Chariots of Fire. If you, if you don't want it, if you're young in here, you probably don't even know what I'm talking about. 1981. I mean, I was only four or five years old, but um, it's a story of, of these Olympic runners in the 1924 Olympics. One of the, the runners, his name was uh, Eric Little, Liddell, whatever, however you want to say it. He was a Scottish Presbyterian preacher who went on to become a missionary in China. Another character in the movie, his name was Harold Abrams, was one of his rivals in the Olympics. There's a contrast between these two characters. For Liddell, he says that when I run, I feel God's pleasure. 
He runs out of his sense of grace and delight, wanting to glorify God and honor God through his running. I'm not sure how running glorifies anybody, to be honest with you. If you see me running, somebody's chasing me, so come on, join me. I don't run. Sorry. For all you runners out there, congratulations. You'll have knee problems later, but I don't. I'm joking. Harold Abrams' motivations are completely different. There's a place in the film where he says, I don't really love it. Talking about running. He says this, I'm more of an addict. There's a difference. There's a contrast there. He's an addict to running. He's addicted to it. There's one scene where he's talking to his latest love interest in the movie, because, you know, they always have to have one of those, and he's just this tortured person. And he says these words, contentment. I'm 24, and I've never known it. I am forever in pursuit. I don't even know what it is I'm chasing. I'll raise my eyes and look down that corridor four feet wide in ten lonely seconds to justify my existence. But will I? That's some deep words that come from his mouth. Can you see what he's doing? He's looking to a gold medal to justify his existence. He's looking for some kind of justification. He's trusting in his achievements, looking to his achievements for a sense of being right in the world. If we do that, we're going to have problems. If we do that personally. Now listen, I'm not saying anything about success. I think everybody should strive for success. Be successful. Success is, is I believe, a blessing from God. And, and, you should, and God will bless you in those areas. But that can't be the only focus we have and we forget about that relationship that comes from Jesus. We can't forget about that. And that's what Paul is saying to the church in Philippi when he's writing these words. He's saying, you're looking at all these accolades. You're looking at all these things that you can achieve or have achieved. And you're forgetting about the whole reason you're able to. Because I'm going to tell you this. God doesn't need money. God doesn't need success. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. But he has it all. It's all his and he owns it all. So why do we think we have done anything? But what we can do is say, I am successful, or things have happened in my life, I'm blessed, whatever reason, because of my ability to put Jesus first above everything else and let him bless it. The prayer should be, God, bless whatever I put my hands to because you've blessed me, because you're in my life, not because I just want something. Does that make sense? Hopefully. I don't know. I kind of went off a little bit. Judaizers, Paul is calling them out because they're the ones that are bragging about everything, bragging and bragging and bragging. He said, I I have something more to brag about than even you do. So you need to chill out a little bit and understand I'm better than you, but I'm actually nothing because it's all him. He's changing things. He's changing the script on them. You see that you can even be a non-religious person and do this where you're looking to justify your existence. You're looking to prove that you're right in the world, that something's right about your life. And it's another expression of this self-salvation attempt, this self-salvation project, the drive to put or to prove ourselves. It's all part of the old foundation. That's the old foundation. That's who we were, not who we are now. Things have to change when you come to know Jesus and you begin that discipleship process. You begin that discipleship journey. The old foundation has to pass away. It has to. Because the old foundation is all about you. The new foundation is all about him. It's a difference. Whether it takes the religious format, the religious connotations, or whether it's, it takes something of secular type of package in your life, whatever it is, it's still this attempt to justify yourself. Be successful, but don't feel like you have to justify yourself in it. Just put Jesus first. All those things are rubbish compared to gaining Christ. Paul did that. 
This was his confidence in the flesh as he expressed in those verses. He was confident in the relationship that he had with Jesus. Not in himself, not in all his achievements, in the relationship he had with Jesus. Will you bow your heads with me this morning? We've looked at the first one, the first of the three this morning, and hopefully next week we'll finish the next two. I'm looking forward to that. So it's, we're going to go a little deeper. But I just believe at this moment, sometimes we get in these, these, these humanity or this, these human nature to try to prove ourselves. And, and drive is good. It's okay to have drive and ambition. And I want to encourage that in everybody. I do. I try my best to, to do the best I can. But at the end of the day, I have to come to the place and say, all that is rubbish. Because gaining Christ is everything for me. So if you're in this room right now, maybe you struggle with that. I want to pray for you. If you're in this room right now and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you don't have that relationship and and you, maybe you're like Nathan Cole. You're just like, I just need to hear the truth. I need, something needs to break, break inside of me. I, I'm, I'm, I'm hard toward this stuff. I don't like religion. Listen, join the club. I don't like religion either. We're not talking about religion. We're talking about relationship. What relationship do you have with Jesus, the Savior that looks at you and goes, you know what, I know you've messed up. I know you've jacked your life up. I know you've done some things that you shouldn't have done in your past, but I'm right here and I died on the cross for you. So if that's you, if you're in here and you say, I, I, I need that relationship with Jesus. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or stand up or any of that stuff, but this is what I'm going to ask you. And I've already, I've already given, I've already got, let the cat out of the bag on this one. I'm going to ask you to take one of those cards in front of you and write on it. Just put I want to know Jesus, or I accept Jesus, or you just write your name and put the big word saved on it. Whatever you want to do, it doesn't matter. We just want to connect with you so that we can help you grow. We'll get you connected in Pastor Joel's D1 class. That's a great place to start. Baptism, it's something that God, that Jesus did, and he told us to do it. These are ways that we can help you, but we have to know who you are. So if you're here today and you say, you know what, I need to, I need to accept Christ. All that takes is in your heart right now, your heart is saying, I need forgiveness, I need a Savior, and I accept him as, as that for me right now. It's, it's that simple. So Lord, this morning, I pray for all those here that maybe they're, they're making that decision right now. God, I pray that you will give them the courage to, to let us know about it so that we can help them grow. And God, for those that are here today that maybe maybe they're in that place that Paul was speaking of in, in the church. He's just going, I, I've, I have all these achievements. I'm so successful in life, and, and I've done this, and I've done this, and I've done this. But, but maybe they need to look at you and say, but Jesus is the one that blessed me with this. He owns it all. I need to give that back to him. He owns it all. But Lord, I... Either way, I just pray for a movement in people's lives. The people that are in this room right now, God, I just pray blessing over them, Lord. I pray the favor of the Lord over them. I pray a continuous joy, no matter what we, we deal with in our lives, because we all go through things. I pray that we can some, somehow, somewhere find the joy of the Lord, the joy of our salvation, the strength that we need to walk with you and to walk in a world that's so lost, but to love them at the same time. God, today I give you glory. I, I thank you for your word. Your word is, is sharper than any two-edged sword, Lord. Your word is piercing. Your word is powerful. God, I thank you for your word and the authority of the Bible that we have. And God, once again, I speak life and I speak blessing over every person here today. In Jesus' name, everybody said Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening. If you would like to learn more about our church or give to our ministry, please visit our website at Bethel.ag.